Rice Chex and Wheat Chex. The bite-sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages present Space Patrol! High adventure in the wild, vast reaches of space. Visions of daring in the name of interplanetary justice. Travel into the future with Buzz Corey, Commander-in-Chief of the Space Patrol! In today's transcribed Space Patrol adventure, a saboteur has just escaped from a locked compartment aboard the Terra 5. Now, with ray guns drawn, Buzz and Happy are searching the ship. He still must have that special spacesuit on, sir. At least it wasn't in the compartment. How did he get out? Smash the door. Uh, the customer. Uh, there he is. After him, Hap. Oh, where you are, I'll fire. He's heading for the weapons compartment. This will stop him. Wow, that ray gun never even phased him. That suit. He's completely shielded. Come on, we'll have to tackle him. He's in the compartment with all the weapons. All right, Halcorn, come out of there. Come and get me. You'd better have something better than a ray gun, because I can drop you if you take another step. We'll return in just a moment with today's exciting Space Patrol adventure, The Test of the XK-3. One bowl of rice checks. Here you are, Commander. Thank you. Me, I'll have wheat checks. Hi, Space Patrollers. This is Commander Corey. And Cadet Happy, having ourselves a top breakfast with our favorite cereals. Checks. Rice checks and wheat checks, Space Patrollers. Tops for taste. Terrific tasting out of the box or out of the bowl. Smoking rockets, they're delicious. Checks are tops for size. Size just right for easy eating. You know something, Space Patrollers? That neat bite size makes checks taste even more delicious. Right, Hap. And gang, a good nourishing breakfast with checks is tops for get up and go. Official Space Patrol get up and go, just like the commander has. So go get them, Space Patrollers. Checks, rice or wheat, in the red and white checkerboard packages. With a picture of me or the swell picture of Cadet Happy on the outside and the free Space Patrol trading card inside. Say, Commander, how about another bowl of checks? This time, I think I'll have rice checks. Make mine wheat checks. And now, today's Space Patrol adventure, the test of the XK-3. Commander Corey faces the problem of capturing Valmer Castro, a criminal whose already clever mind has been transformed into a superintelligence by means of an ingenious brain sensitizer. But as far as the public is concerned, the escaped crime genius is of minor importance compared to a coming race from Pluto to Neptune to test a new space drive for interplanetary flight. Even in Space Patrol headquarters on the man-made planet Terra, the race seems to have taken priority over the search for Castro. In the central office, Buzz Corey focuses a pinpoint tracer beam on a gigantic space chart as Cadet Happy looks on. This will show you the relative positions of Pluto and Neptune, Happy. Yes, sir. They're in opposition to the sun. Right. As far apart from each other as they can ever get. Nearly 7 billion miles, or more than 250 million DU. Wow, that'll be some race. Mm -hmm. It's the longest straight line distance between any two relatively stable points in the solar system. Yes, sir. But if the distance is the object, why not race the two ships clear around the orbit of Pluto? Uh, that may come later, Hap. But if the XK-3 performs the way we think it will, no further test or demonstration will be necessary. Well, then you think the XK-3 is sure to win? Well, it's too early to be certain about something as new and revolutionary as the new space drive, Happy. Well, from what I hear, nobody but a lot of old fogies think the Atlas stands a chance. Well, I wouldn't call a man an old fogey merely because he puts his faith in something that's been proved dependable. The Atlas has covered billions of DUs with the standard drive. I'd sure like to be aboard the XK-3, Commander. No one is going to be aboard either ship. Each will be robot controlled. Oh, to keep the human element out of the contest, huh? At the present stage, the XK-3 space drive isn't shielded against radiation. Oh? If the test is successful, shielding will be installed, but it would be pretty expensive to shield a unit that probably will have to be pulled apart anyway for a checkup. All right, Happy, suppose we forget about the race and settle down to work. Huh? Yeah, and that means Volmer Castro. Any leads on him yet, sir? Uh, we're checking on his past associates. Yeah, but now that he's got his super brain, he'll probably get himself a new gang. Crook's more in keeping with his high IQ. That's undoubtedly what Castro wants to do, but it'll take time. Smart as he is, Castro can't go it alone. He's wanted by the space patrol. He'll need help. Obviously, no honest man will help him. So he'll have to contact some of his old gang. Right. The doctor's cerebroscope didn't put facts or knowledge in Castro's brain. It only made his brain more able to use the facts that are already there. Right now, he'll use that intelligence to gratify his old selfish motives and weaknesses. Well, uh, what are his weaknesses, sir, outside of stealing? That's what we want to find out from his former associates. Let's contact Captain Damon and see if he's picked up any of Castro's old gang. 
Elsewhere, in a small community on the planet Mars, Balmer Castro seems entirely unconcerned by the fact that he is number one on the space patrol list of wanted criminals. His penetrating eyes never leave those of his visitor, a tall, burly spaceship technician named Grant Halcorn. You understand, Halcorn? You leave at once for the Pluto test base. Your traveling instructions are in this folder. Well, look, Mr. Casco, I, I don't know about getting inside the base. It's all been arranged. We'll have no trouble if you keep your mouth shut. Once you're aboard the XK-3, well, you know what to do. I suppose they make a check of the ship before blastoff. Of course they will. But they won't be looking for stowaways. Not in that gear compartment smack up against the space drive unit. Now, they'll be too interested in checking instruments and controls. I'm worried about that spacesuit, Mr. Castro. Doesn't seem like much protection. It's been thoroughly tested. You'll have done your work and be out of the ship before a harmful dose of radiation has a chance to penetrate. Yeah, if I can stand the exhilaration. That suit's awful bulky. Suppose I can't move to the escape hatch. The XK-3 won't be given high acceleration until the flight's well underway. By that time, well, you'll have made the necessary adjustments to the robot controls to prevent acceleration. Mm, sure. And then I bail out as a ship crosses the Jupiter orbit. That's right. Your jetpack will be sufficient to give you a trajectory away from the XK-3's vector, and I'll pick you up. Okay, Mr. Castro. I got this, Halcorn. I've got a considerable sum of money on this race. The XK-3 is the heavy favorite. If the Atlas wins, I'll have ten million credits to set up my organization. Now, don't worry. The XK-3 won't stand a chance. Naturally. Two days later, in Space Patrol headquarters, Boz and Happy check through data Space Patrol agents have supplied on Castro and former members of his gang. On the huge space chart, two small lights, one red, one green, move with agonizing slowness sunward from Pluto. Despite the temptation to watch the progress of the race, Happy diligently checks the reports. What a bum this guy Castro is, Commander. Even his pals can't trust him. Here are six guys who've told our agents that if they even saw Castro again, they'd bust him in the jaw. Well, yeah, they might have said that just for effect. Did any of them say why they were angry at him? Yes, sir. They're all sore about the same thing. Castro made bets with them and then welched when he lost. But he always collected when he won. Hmm. Very interesting, Happy. Very interesting. We've just learned something quite useful about Castro. We have? Yes. He's a gambler. Yeah, and very unsportsmanlike. I'll notify our undercover men to keep an eye on suspected big-time gamblers. They'll need cooperation from local authorities on that. Gambling is out of space before jurisdiction. Well, some guys will gamble on anything. I know a mechanic who's betting on the Atlas. I imagine a guy who's supposed to know something about spaceships, and he bets against the XK-3. Well, perhaps out of sense of loyalty, Happy. You know how fond you can get of a spaceship, whether you fly it or help repair it. Well, he's one of those old fogies who doesn't like anything new. <laughs> We must have a lot of old fogies in the universe, Hap. A lot of intelligent people think the Atlas will win. People must be crazy. The odds are 20 to 1. And look at the chart, sir. The Atlas blasted off ahead of the XK-3, and already the XK-3 is gaining. The race has just started. Neptune is still millions of DUs away. Uh, well, the only way the Atlas can win is for somebody to fire a space torpedo into the XK-3. Uh, if you're worried about somebody blasting the XK-3, forget it. I've assigned patrol ships from every planet to guard the race vector. Oh, the lucky guy that drew the assignment for Terra. Uh, who got it, sir? Happy, uh, I've volunteered to patrol the Terra sector, and now if you'd like to go along... Would I? Smoking rockets? <laughs> I I mean, uh, well, yes, sir. Well, there's plenty of time. The lead ship isn't even to the Saturn orbit yet. Yeah, the Atlas is leading. Uh, but I bet the first ship we see is the XK-3. Here it comes, Commander, and right on vector. Yes, fairly close to schedule, too. Adjust the viewscope sensitivity control, Hap. Let's see which ship it is. Oh, it's the XK-3, of course. What else could... Hey. Commander, it's the Atlas. Why shouldn't it be the Atlas? It blasted off first. It's the total elapsed time that determines the winner. Well, yes, sir, but the way the XK-3 was gaining at first... I'll check with Pluto. Commander Corey aboard Terra-5 calling Pluto Space Control, XK-3 robot testing section. Corey to XK-3 testing section. This is XK-3 testing section. Go ahead, Commander. The Atlas just passed Terra patrol segment of the test vector, approximately on schedule. Yes, sir. We've been monitoring the Atlas control section. The Atlas was thrown off a vector by meteors outside the Saturn orbit. Velocity was reduced, and vector changed to avoid meteors. The Atlas is now back on plotted vector, but behind schedule. What about the XK-3? We are having trouble, sir. What kind of trouble? Well, Colonel Balcom thinks it's the space drive. Acceleration hasn't developed as it should. Could it be the robot controls? No, the colonel doesn't think so. 
The new space drive responded perfectly beyond the limit of previous tests. But now there seems to be a uh, dampening off, as the colonel expressed it. And you can't compensate by adjusting the robot controls? We'll try that, Commander. The trouble showed up near the Jupiter orbit. We are in complete control here on Pluto, except that the space drive seems to choke itself off. The colonel described it as a self-limiting function inherent in the drive force. Acceleration is becoming deceleration. But I would be glad to relay any suggestion to the colonel. Colonel Balcom is in complete charge of the XK-3. There are no suggestions. Corey, out. Of all the rotten luck... His private cruiser, Valmer Castro, carefully adjusts his spacephone receiver to a prearranged frequency while holding a vector some distance from that of the test course. Hello, Corner Castro. Hello, Corner Castro. Castro here. Keep your transmitter powers. It is. I can reach you. Uh, if you got a fix on this ship, I'm going to bail out. I've stuck with this crate too long already. Now, there was a reason. The Atlas was delayed by meteors. I didn't want the XK-3 to gain an advantage because of that. Uh, she's choked down now, Chief. The more they try to accelerate her from blue to control, the more she'll slough off. Good. Bail out. I'll pick you up. Listen, I'm only a speck in space. The momentum of the ship will carry me forward. I can mentally compute your trajectory when you leave the ship. And don't worry. I may have to hold off until patrol ships are out of range. Scope, sir. The XK-3. But it might as well be a century-old tub the way it's blooping along. I can't understand it, Hap. There's nothing in the short test of the XK-3 to suggest trouble like this with a new space drive. Somebody in Pluto robot control is goofing up. Well, that's unlikely, Hap. Any defect in a robot control system would show up in the self-analyzer, the self-monitoring system. And you know as well as I. Hap, look at the viewscope screen, number three. Smoking rockets. What is it, a baby meteor? I don't think so. At any rate, it's receding from us. No meteor was ever that shape. Get a vector on it, Hap. Yes, sir. Hey, am I nuts? It looks like a man. A man in a space suit. You're right. Line him up on the vector computer, quickly. Well, what in the name of Jupiter's moons is he doing out there? Now, I've got it, sir. Unless he's changed course with a jetpack or something, this is the way it lines up. His vector would cross that of the XK-3. Yes, sir. But backtracking the XK-3 vector, the ship and the man were at the intersecting point at the same instant. Either they came mighty close to a collision, or... Or the man's trajectory began at the ship. In other words, he was aboard the XK-3. But that's impossible. Nobody could survive the radiation from the power unit. It's completely unshielded. I'm changing vector. We're going to overtake that man. Get into a spacesuit, Hap, and then into the airlock. Get ready to pull him aboard. In a few moments, the Terra-5 has adjusted its forward velocity to match that of the man in the spacesuit. In his own spacesuit, Cadet Happy waits in the airlock with the outer hatch open, ready to pull the man into the ship. Now the strange Voyager floats rigidly, like an inflated toy a few feet from the open hatch, as Happy directs Commander Corey by spacephone. I've got him, sir. I'm pulling him in. Uh, careful. Is he armed? No, sir. He's got a new type of spacesuit. Thick metal. It, it looks like a... Uh-oh, my radiation indicator's clicking like mad. This guy's as radioactive as a ton of uranium. Get him after the decontamination compartment, quickly. Following Commander Corey's orders, Cadet Happy takes the unresisting captive to the decontamination compartment, thrusts him in, and turns on the radiation neutralizers. Half an hour later, at the commander's request, Happy goes back aft to investigate, then rushes to the control compartment. He's gone. He, he's got out of the compartment. What? It's empty, sir. He must be hiding further aft. I'll cut on to automatic control. All right, come on. Have your ray gun ready. Yes, sir. He must still have that special spacesuit on, sir. At least it wasn't in the compartment. How did he get out? It smashed the door. Uh, but the radiation must have been neutralized. The decontaminator was off automatically. Uh, there he is. After him, Hap. All we are, I'll fire. Commander, he's heading for the weapons compartment. This will stop him. <laughs> Oh, the ray gun never even phased him. That suit is completely shielded. Come on, we'll have to tackle him. He's in the compartment with all those weapons. All right, come out of there. Come and get me. And you better have something better than a ray gun. Because I can drop you if you take another step. We'll return to Space Patrol in just a moment. This is Dick Tufel with news from Edwards Air Force Base, Muroc, California. 
I've got an interesting story for you this morning about one of the most unusual-looking planes in the sky today, the XF-92A, designed by Convair Aircraft San Diego. Now, in just a second, I'm going to introduce you to the Air Force test pilot on that plane, Major Chuck Yeager, the first man to fly faster than the speed of sound. But first, I'd like to tell you a few things about the XF-92A. It looks exactly like a triangle. It's often called the flying triangle. Wings are swept back at a severe angle, 60 degrees. Top speed of this Air Force interceptor is about 700 miles per hour. Service ceiling is over 45,000 feet. And it takes some doing to test fly a ship like that. You need energy, plenty of it. And to face the risk involved, you need steady nerves. And now let's hear what a real test pilot has to say about it. Meet Chuck Yeager. Let me tell you what it takes to be a test pilot. To start with, I have to be in good condition. That means get plenty of rest, plenty of exercise, and good food at every meal. For breakfast, I like a cereal that really tastes good and has plenty of energy. Like rice checks and wheat checks, right, Chuck? Yes, checks are the cereals that are tops three ways. For taste, for size, for real get-up-and-go. So make sure you keep yourself ready for action, the way famous test pilots do. Pick your cereal for flavor and for energy. Today, get rice checks and wheat checks. And remember, they're tops with America's top pilots. And now, back to our Space Patrol adventure, the test of the XK-3. Buzz and Happy patrolling the Terra segment of a test race vector between Pluto and Neptune discover a man in a spacesuit hurtling through space on an angle from the course of the XK-3. Buzz suspects the man has been aboard the robot-controlled XK-3, but does not know that he is Grant Halcorn, hired by Valmer Castro to sabotage the experimental ship. When Halcorn escapes from the radiation decontamination compartment, Buzz and Happy fire their ray guns at him, but with no result. Halcorn reaches the weapons compartment of the Terra 5 and threatens to shoot the space patrolman if they move. You might as well put up those ray guns. They won't penetrate this suit. And if you come a step closer, I'll put you both to sleep. What will we do, Commander? This ray gun will work on both of you, even through the cadet suit. You know it. Well, what are you going to do? All right. Step out and let's talk it over. There's nothing to talk over. Just keep your distance, Commander. Just who are you? And what are you doing aboard the XK-3? Well, you figured that out, huh? Well, I don't think there's any harm in telling you now. I'm Grant Halcorn. I was just making sure that the XK-3 wouldn't win the race against the Atlas. Who are you working for? What makes you think I'm working for anybody? Because really smart men don't run risks of radiation burns, even in shielded suits. The smart boys hire chumps like you to take all the chances. Oh, is that so? Now, who would want the new spaceship drive to fail? Someone interested in standard drive ships? Maybe. No, Halcorn. Anyone in the industry would realize that one failure wouldn't stop progress. The only one who would benefit would be a man who would bet heavily against the favorite. In other words, a professional gambler. A gambler who refuses to take chances. Someone like Valmer Castro. All right, Corey. I haven't got time to listen to you. Get moving, both of you. I hit it right, didn't I, Halcorn? I said shut up. Go on. Move forward. You too. So smart, Corey. Well, this time you're up against some real brains. Hold it. Well, it's in this compartment. Never mind, I'll look myself. Yeah. Empty. In you go, Commander. Go on! Yeah. That'll hold Corey. Now, you, cadet, you're coming up forward and show me how to work your space phone. I've got to contact a certain party. All right, cadets, stand right where you are. If you move, I'll put you out cold with a ray gun. Got it? Sure, sure, big shot. Alcorn to Castro. Alcorn calling Castro. Castro here, go ahead. I'll make it short, chief. Aboard Corey's flagship, the Terra 5, but don't worry, I'm in charge. You telling the truth? Sure. Commander's locked up in a compartment, and the cadet's here at the business end of a ray gun. Now, here's what I did. I'm I not th- interested in details. We haven't much time. Head for Jupiter's fourth moon. You know the place I mean. Yeah, you bet. Land and come aboard. Then we'll blast off for Venus and wait there until my men collect the bets. You'll collect, all right. The Atlas is sure to win. I know. Now, change vector for Jupiter moon number four as quickly as you can. Castro out. All right, Chief. So the commander was right. You are working for Castro. Shut up and take those controls. 
Head this ship to Jupiter number four. Now, don't try any cute antics. What's that? The meteor alarm? Yeah, I don't know. Smoke on rockets is the air system. There's a leak in the hull. Uh, where? Uh, check the indicator. There, see where that red light's flashing? Yeah, yeah I see. Well, where's the damage? In compartment three. We, we've got to get there quick. Well, take it easy. It's airtight, isn't it? You and I have got spacesuits, son. Yeah, but Commander Corey's in there. He hasn't got a spacesuit. That's his tough luck. Uh, look, Halcorn, if you bring the commander into Castro alive, uh, isn't that going to boost your stop? Yeah, that's right. Well, then hurry. If we act quickly, maybe we can save him. All right, get going. Uh, here's compartment three. Close your face piece. Okay. Gun, uh, uh, Drop it. Uh, I've got him, Happy. Raise the space piece. Yes, sir. And sit on him. He's hard to handle. All right, Halcorn. Just relax. Now take it easy, uh, Halcorn. There's no hole in the hull. Oh, that's a relief, sir. But what set off the alarm? The thermostat on the bulkhead. The thermostat? But it'll only sound an alarm if it registers excessive cold or heat. It was heat that did it. Have friction from rubbing my belt against it. Let's get Halcorn out of that spacesuit so it'll be easier to handle. And we'll get him up forward. And Halcorn, if you know what's good for you, you'll talk. That's the straight truth, Commander. Castro's waiting for me on Jupiter's fourth moon. First, I'd like to restore the XK-3's robot controls to normal. Yeah, there's nothing you can do about that, Corey. The XK-3 must be virtually in free fall by now. If we take all the acceleration we can stand, we can overtake the XK-3 and correct those instruments. How can we locate the XK-3? Pluto's space control is probably broadcasting periodic reports. Check that frequency. I'll get into Halcorn's shielded suit and be ready to go aboard. By the time Buzz has donned the heavy, cumbersome spacesuit, Happy has obtained a fix on the XK-3. It is still hurtling on toward Neptune at a steady velocity, but of course losing ground to the still-accelerating Atlas. With Happy at the controls and Halcorn securely bound, the Terra-5 gains steadily on the XK-3. Then Commander Corey steps into the airlock, ready to transfer to the robot ship. With the space phone transmitter at low power, Happy contacts Buzz. We're alongside, Commander. Ready when you are, Hap. Apply magnetic holding field. Yes, sir. Airlock's joined, sir. Very good, Happy. I'm going aboard. Everything okay, sir? Yes, Hap. I'm at the robot instrument panel now. Can you fix it, sir? Yes, but I'd defy anybody to figure out what was wrong if they didn't know exactly what Halcorn did in here. He's made adjustments that gradually cancel out the control impulses from Pluto. I didn't think Halcorn was that bright. He just followed instructions. Castro is the genius. He's figured out the right combination to dampen the controls. Something that wouldn't happen by accident once in a million times. Wow. I've about got it reset, Hap. It'll take several seconds to build up the balance, which is lucky. It'll give me time to get back to Terra 5 before the space drive takes hold. I'll be ready to cut loose, sir. Do it the second I give the word, Hap. There. That's the last setting. Stand by. Standing by, sir. I'm in the airlock, Hap. Disengage holding field. Okay, sir. Smoke and rockets. The XK-3 really took off. Are you okay, Commander? Yes. I'll go back to the decontamination compartment and neutralize this radiation. You set a vector for Jupiter's fourth moon. Following the directions of Grant Halcorn, Cadet Happy skims low over the surface of Jupiter's moon number four. Suddenly, below them, in a crater, Buzz and Happy see a private space cruiser. A few moments later, inside the cruiser, Valmer Castro watches with grim satisfaction as a figure lumbers across the floor of the crater in a bulky spacesuit. Then, as he hears steps in the airlock, he draws a ray gun and holds it behind his back. Well, Halcorn, raise your face piece and get out of that suit. It must be very uncomfortable. Hello, Castro. Corey! Hold it. Don't move. Oh, come now, Castro. A man of your intelligence should know that a ray gun can't penetrate this shielded suit. It might work at close range. You better hold it, Corey. I warned you. 
Hand over the gun. All right, Casper. Get into a spacesuit. I'm taking you aboard Terra 5. And get this simple fact into that super brain of yours. One false move and I'll... Castro, get that suit off, and we'll put you back aft with your friend, Halcorn. Prepare to blast off, Happy. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, what's so funny, Castro? Well, just amused. You know, when I'm discharged from the center, I'll be free of what you call my criminal tendencies. But I'll still have my superior intellect. I hope so. And I'll have more than that. I'll be a very rich man, Corey. And what will you be doing? Still risking your neck while every crook in the solar system hopes you'll break it. Frankly, that's what I like. But what makes you think you'll be a rich man? From the money I've won on the race. I can still collect, you know. Happy, get the Neptune Space Control Channel, will you please? Yes, sir. Bulletin, NY-459. Repeating for all Space Patrol units. Neptune City Space Control. The robot cargo ship Atlas has just landed at the spaceport completing a non-stop flight from Pluto. See what I tell you, I won. The Atlas arrived just two hours and 15 minutes after the XK-3 broke all what? records. It's impossible. The XK-3 with its new space drive roared into victory despite a long delay that gave the Atlas a 10 million DU lead. Official figures of the XK-3's record run will be released at 0900 Universal Star Time. Neptune Space Control out. It, it can't be. I don't believe in gambling, Castro, but this is one bet you're going to pay in full. Ready for blast off, sir. Fire rockets. Fire rockets. Up, shipping away. In just a moment, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure brought to you by Nestle's Quick for the greatest tasting chocolate milk and those famous Nestle chocolate bars. Hey, gang, do you hear this at your house? Come and get it! Nestle's Quick! Yes, that's the Nestle's Quick Call, music to the ears of every Space Patroller. Quick makes the most delicious chocolate milk ever invented. It's rich, it's smooth, it's super chocolatey. Tastes just like those wonderful Nestle's chocolate bars. And say, you can make your own frosty glass of Nestle's Quick in no time flat, any time you want it. Because after you pour out your glass of milk, yes, I said after, then you just put in two spoonfuls of smooth chocolate quick powder and give it a little stir. And gang, that's all you have to do to make the chocolate milk that's real George. Mom will find Nestle's Quick in the big brown and yellow can, so ask her to get plenty because Quick is so full of vitamin D, it's better than good for you. Come and get it! Nestle's Quick! And now, a preview of next week's exciting Space Patrol adventure. Buzz and Happy are testing a new spaceship out beyond the Saturn orbit. Suddenly, they find themselves on a collision course with another spaceship. That pilot must be crazy. He suddenly changed vector right toward us. He's not trying evasive action, so it's up to us. Fire starboard rockets. Commander, he's still coming at us. Half that ship is a robot-controlled guided missile. If we don't blow it up, it'll hit us. Stand by to fire space torpedoes. Standing by, sir. Fire one. Commander, the torpedo controls are jammed. We're going to crash! Be sure to join us next week for the thrilling story, The Image of Evil. <laughs> Space Patrol, created by Mike Moser, starring Ed Cameras, Commander Corey, and Lynn Osborne as Cadet Happy, was written by Lou Houston. Produced and directed by Larry Robertson, executive producer Mike Devery. <laughs> Other players were Bela Kovach, Norman Jolly, and Ken Mayer. Dick Tufel speaking. <laughs> Now, don't forget to tune in next Saturday and every Saturday for the new exciting Space Patrol! <laughs> Space Patrol was brought to you today by Rice Chex and Wheat Chex, the bite-sized cereals in the red and white checkerboard packages. Be sure to see another exciting Space Patrol program on your local ABC television station. Consult your local paper for time and channel. This program is broadcast to our armed forces overseas through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Space Patrol came to you transcribed from Hollywood. This is ABC Radio Network.
Take one man on a mission of vengeance. Let him stalk a brutal, unknown killer in a town of strangers. That's our story. Dead Ringer, taken from the files of John Steele. Adventurer. Hello, friends. This is John Steele. We're back this week to bring you another story of suspense and hard, fast action. So turn down the light, get a grip on that chair, and hang on. This week's tale takes us out to the blistering sands of our own western desert where I first met Bill Allen. But here he is to tell you his story himself. Bill? You know, home is a funny thing. When you're there, you never appreciate it. But every mile you get away from it, it starts looking better and better. At least that's the way it was with me. I'd had a fight with my pa, and I'd been away from home for 15 years, but somehow I'd never really been out of touch with the old place. Every week, pa had the Canyon City Herald sent to me, and every once in a while, I'd get a hankering to go back, but I kept putting it off. Then one day, something happened that made up my mind for me. The Herald said pa had been shot dead, and his killer had got away. I took the train to the nearest depot, bought a horse, and started the three-day ride across the desert to Canyon City. I guess it was about the middle of the second day. The sun was out. It was hot as blazes. All right, come on, boy, now. Keep your head up. Okay, okay, fella. You want to rest? We will. Seems to me you've been resting more than you've been walking. All right. Go on, take a stretch for yourself. What's the matter, fella? I'm hot, too, you know. If you'd use a little of that pep when I'm on your back, we'd have been in Canyon City by now. Huh? What's the matter? Okay, okay, I'm coming. Don't get hot under the saddle. I don't know why you just can't take it easy like any other horse. It's you, you gotta go run. Huh? Hey, no wonder you was fussing. All right, take it easy, mister. Wait till I get you rolled over. Oh. There. Water, yeah. All right, just take it easy, fella. All right, there you are. Hey, 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 not so much, not so much. <coughs> Sand. Huh? Sand. Yeah, plenty of it, huh? No, no. Sand. Well, you just lay back and rest. Sand. Yeah, I heard you. Now, you leave everything to me, I'll have you fixed up in no time. <coughs> Mister. Hey, mister. Hey, he's dead. Almost be identification on him someplace. No, it's not here. Well, maybe the back pockets. No. Oh, yeah. yeah, here's a wallet. Let's see his money. He must have cards. Oh, yeah. yeah. Caleb Baxter, Butte, Montana. Montana? Why not? Yeah, why not? Did you ever play a hunch? That's what I did. It just seemed to me that if Pa had enemies in Canyon City, I'd do a lot better if I changed my name. I took his guns off him and buried him there in the desert, and from then on, I was Caleb Baxter. I got into town late the third day and headed for the only hotel. I figured if Baxter had been a stranger in Canyon City, he'd have stayed there. If I got past the desk using the name, I could get away with it anywhere in town. I signed the register, and the clerk looked at it and just handed me my key, and that was that. So I cleaned up and headed over to the bar across the street. Yes, sir, mister, what'll it be? Uh, whiskey, straight. Yes, sir, whiskey, straight. I'm telling you, Wendy, I ought to run you out of town. What'd you say? I said I ought to run you out of town. Why, sir, you couldn't walk anybody out of town. What's more, run about? <laughs> Why, that was the worst haircut a man ever got. Well, now, I'm telling you, Sam, them shooters had a tough time getting around the corners on that square head of yours. <laughs> <laughs> now, you listen to me, Wendy. Yes, sir, you know, Mr. Wendy, I'm 
glass of whiskey. Oh, I leave the bottle. Yeah. What's going on down there? Oh, they're just getting old Windy. He's a town barber. Has been for years. Windy Town. What say, mister? Uh, nothing. I ain't gonna take it no more, that boy. Uh, what? You uh, made a fool out of me for the last time. No, 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 wait a minute, Sam. Now, uh, get back. We was just the fool. This thing's loaded. Uh, don't you think you'd better... Hey, any of you, uh, any of you guys know Windy Thompson? Uh, yes, sir, mister, that's me. That's well, me. I've been looking for you. Uh, what for? Well, you see, a partner of mine come through Canyon City a few months back... And you give him a haircut. Well, now, mister, any time I... He can said you, you were the worst barber west of the Big Bend country. Uh, uh, what? And if I ever got out here, I was to get his quarter back or have your hide. He did, did and he? Well, he was right, mister. I'm telling you, that man should be behind bars. He does something to a head of hair. That's yeah. what I heard. Now, look at me, for instance. Uh, would you mind putting that gun up? Makes me a little nervous. Hmm? Oh, oh, yeah. Well, now, look at me. I ain't got much hair, but... Well, it appears I... to me like Wendy owes you one on the house. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, he sure does. What'd he say, Wendy? Uh, okay, okay. All right, now supposing you and me have a drink, Wendy. Sure, yeah. sure, sure. Yeah, and don't you forget either. Yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. Uh, whiskey? Sure, sure. Yeah, uh, about that partner of yours. I don't remember cutting any... I just made that up. He, he, you what? Hey, Sam, he... Shut up. Huh? Don't you know when you're well off? <laughs> Guess I ought to thank you. Well, somebody had to do something. Yeah, uh, what's your name? Baxter, Caleb Baxter. Yeah? Well, thanks, Baxter. That was mighty fast thinking, young man. Hmm? Howdy, Mr. Clements. Hello, Wendy. <laughs> Baxter, Mr. Clements. He runs a town paper. Oh, hi. Baxter. Yeah. Baxter, you from around here? No, I'm a stranger in town. Oh, I knew that name wasn't on the subscription list. No. Say, uh, you might be able to help me, Mr. Clements. Come on, we can talk over at my table. Go ahead, kid. I'll wait for you. Okay. <laughs> By all rights, I should be mad at you. Oh, why? Well, you took a good headline away from uh. me. <laughs> Uh, now, what can I do for you? Why, well, I, I want to talk to you about Jed Allen. What did you say your name was? Caleb Baxter. What do you want to know about Jed Allen? Did he have any enemies? No, none that I know of. I heard there was a couple of people around that had it in for him. Possible. He came in town quite a bit, didn't he? No, Jed stuck pretty close to the ranch. Uh, did he own his place? Never heard he didn't. What's on your mind, Baxter? Nothing. Is any strangers in town? Mm, well, I haven't seen any. What do you mean by that? Well, there was a rumor going around that someone was living in the old Benson place. Where's that? But, uh, it's just a little shack south end of town. It was just a rumor. Well, thanks, Mr. Clements. Uh, look, can I drop in and talk to you again? Anytime, Baxter, anytime. Thanks. Wendy. Yeah, yeah. Oh, come here a minute. Yeah, what's up, kid? Do you know the old Benson place? Sure. Will you take me to it? Let's go. Come on. Oh, boy. Oh, 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 oh. Here. Oh, oh, oh. It's about 100 feet down the road on the right. Okay, thanks. I'll wait here. Sure, like to know what's going on around here. Mm -hmm. You dirty low. Hey, what, what happened? Somebody took a shot at me. Where'd you come from? Over by the shack. I took a couple of him, but I don't think I hit him. Hey, there he goes. What? Come on. Yeah. All right. Come on. All right, which way did he go? Headed out of town. Come on. Oh, oh, oh. Too dark. Lost him. Yeah, yeah. Or I might as well head back to town. Next morning, I went over to the Herald's office and told Mr. Clements what had happened. He suggested I go out to the ranch and talk to the old Mexican woman that had kept house for Paul. Seems strange riding out that road I'd been over so many times as a kid. Just as if I'd never been away. The prairie was lying hot and dusty under a broiling sun, not a breath of air stirring. Then I come over the rise by the split pine. There was the ranch, nestling down in the hollow under the big shade tree. I rode through the gate, past the spring house, with the moss on the roof, and on up to the hitching rail. All the hands must have been out working the herd, because there wasn't a living thing in sight. 
there was no way to come home. Madre me, I am coming. You have to break down the door. Hello, ma'am. What you want? I'd like to come in and rest a bit. <laughs> it's hot riding. There is water at the spring house. Uh, well, it's more than that, ma'am. See, I'd like to talk to you. Who you are? Uh, Baxter, ma'am. Caleb Baxter. I do not know you. No, no. I, I, I want to talk to you about Mr. Allen. I am busy. Go away. Oh, please, ma'am. See, it's kind of important. All right, all right. You talk. Can I come in? Madre mia. Thank you. What are you looking at? The room. Nice room. Stay out of there. I won't hurt nothing, ma'am. Stay out. Please. Look, I'm busy. What do you want? How long did you work for Mr. Allen? Ten, twelve years. These his guns? Leave them alone. Okay. Nice man to work for? Senor Allen. See, si. good man. Yeah, I thought so. Never get angry. Never. Yeah. Everyone his friend. <laughs> See. Si. It's his picture over the fireplace. Nice looking man. I don't know who could do this thing. No, no, don't get upset. He was so good. What's your name? Maria. That's better. See, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, Maria. See? Si. Was there anyone who'd kill Mr. Allen? No. No one would kill Senor Allen. Somebody did, though. Now, think, Maria. Have you any idea who might have done it? No one. Any of the ranch hands? No. Anybody in town? No. Think, Maria. Please. You go now, please. Okay. Such a terrible thing. Why do not someone do something? We will, Maria. We will. I'd counted on Maria giving me some kind of lead, and instead I'd got nothing. The killer's trail was as cold as a mountain stream. I didn't know what to do next. On the way back into town, I stopped in at Wendy's barbershop. I needed somebody to talk to, and he was as good as any. Howdy, kid. Be doing it, Jiffy. It's okay, Wendy. No hurry. Get yourself down, Caleb. Find a couple of good gazettes there. Thanks. <laughs> so then I said to him, Mr. I don't care what you have to say. I don't think Canyon City needs a new highway. Why, if he puts one of them concrete racetracks through our town, why, there's no telling what kind of furniture will be getting around here. Why, I said, I wouldn't vote for it if the governor herself came down here and said, Wendy, Canyon City's got to be put on the map. No, sir. I said, don't count on me. And he gave me a lot of hocus pocus about being behind the times and such. And when he was all through, I said, Mister, I still feel the same way. That'll be 25 cents, Joe. Thank you. Nice talking to you. Okay, kid, you're next. You remember Joe from the saloon, don't you, kid? Yeah, sure. Hi, Joe. Hello, Baxter. See you tonight, Joe. Yeah. What'll it be, Caleb? A uh, haircut and leave me something to comb. <laughs> Just don't you worry. <laughs> Got something to tell you soon, Joe Thieves. Uh, said I see you tonight, Joe. Yeah. You look through the new gazette? No, ain't had time. Don't know why he can't buy his own. Hey, you see this one on page 17? Good as last month? Better. Oh, well, uh, let me see. <laughs> Thank God you're right. <laughs> hey, Wendy, how about my haircut? Huh? Oh, oh, sure, 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 sure. <laughs> you ought to see that one. I did. Huh. Tell me, what's this about a new highway? State's been trying to put it through ever since the war. But it's just like I was saying. Don't the townspeople want it? Ah, oh, some does and some don't. You see, they... Bring a lot of business to town. That's what Mr. Clement says, but, uh, you say he was leaving, Joe? No hurry. I don't go to work till five. Ah. Thinks a barbershop's a public library. And for two bits, too. Clements is right, you know. About what? The road. Oh. Well, they're putting it up to a public refer, uh, public, uh, refer, mm, refer, uh, referendum. Uh, yeah, yeah, vote, vote. Sure to be beaten, though. Why? Well, for one thing, the ranchers don't want it. They swing a lot of weight in this town. Yeah, I guess they do. Well, and be seeing you next month, Wendy. You said don't come out till the fifth. <laughs> be in on the sixth. <laughs> See you, Baxter. <laughs> yeah, so long, Joe. Thought he'd never go. Forgot my I... hat. <clears throat> yeah, sure, sure. Be seeing you. Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure, sure. <clears throat> oh, what you have to tell me? I've been thinking since last night, kid, and I figure you went down to the Benson place looking for somebody. Yeah. Well, I put two and two together, and since that's where the Allen killer was supposed to hit out, 
I figure that's who you're looking for. What if I am? Well, Mr. Clemens was in for a haircut about an hour ago. You know, been cutting his hair for years. He likes a little off the top What'd and on say, the side. Huh? What'd what? he say? Oh, oh, well, uh, yeah, well, he said the Allen killer was back in town. You sure? Yep. And he was seen riding out towards the Allen Ranch this morning. Clemens said that? Yep, yep. Uh, hey, where are you going? I'll pay you later. If Clemens was right, I must have passed the killer on the road, only he'd seen me coming and ducked into the mesquite till I'd gone by. If I hurried, I might still catch him out the ranch. I put the leather to my horse and rode a hard as she'd go all the way out. When I topped the rise by the split pine, I reined up and looked down on the buildings in the hollow. Everything looked the same. The hot afternoon sun was beating down on the barns. The hands were still out working. Nothing had changed. I looked over at the hitching rail, but there wasn't any horse tied up there. I rode through the gate and on up to the house. Maria! Maria! That's a lot. Maria! Go away! Open the door. No! I gotta talk to you. Go away! Look, I don't want to frighten you, Maria, but if you don't open the door, I'm gonna break it down. What do you want? I just want to talk to you, that's all. You talk. What's a gun for? You talk. I'm coming in. No! Yeah. No! Now, give me that gun! No! You... Hey, you crazy? You might have hurt somebody with that thing. I don't know nothing. Please, you go. Now, look, somebody was here today. Who was it? No one here. Yeah, I know. He's gone. But who was it? I tell you, no one here. You're lying, Maria. I tell I'm you. I'm not leaving till you tell me who was here today. Please. Well, maybe you're covering up for somebody. I do not understand. Are you? Please. No one here. Could you be telling the truth? See, si, see. Si. That doesn't make sense. You go now. Well, I'm sorry I frightened you, but what are these? No. Picayunes, huh? Pretty strong cigarette for you to smoke, isn't it, Maria? Please. Wasn't here this morning. Whose are they? I don't know nothing. Okay. Okay, Maria. But now I got something to work on. I rode back to town with a pack of picayunes in my pocket. They weren't much of a lead, but it was better than nothing. All I knew was that the killer was somewheres in town and he'd been out to the ranch. That was all. As I was tying up in front of the hotel, Windy came running out, waving something hey, in his hey, hand. Hey, kid, where you been, kid? Huh? All Ned's been busting loose in this here town. What do you mean? Here, here, look at this. What? Headline, read it, read it. Killer to surrender tonight. Sure, go on, go on. Harvey Clemens, editor of the Canyon City Herald, was contacted by the killer of Jed Allen this afternoon and has arranged for a surrender to Sheriff Steele at 6 o'clock this evening. It is requested that all citizens remain indoors. Yeah, what do you think of that, huh? What time is it, Wendy? First extra the Herald's had What since time I... is it? Huh? Time uh, is it? 5.30. Come on. Yeah, where are we going? To the Herald. But the paper says... i got to see Mr. Clemens. What part? i got to see him, that's all. Well... Come on, inside. Mr. Clemens. What? Oh, hello, Baxter. See the paper yet? Yeah. What do you think of the news? It's good. Yeah, we've been looking all over for you. Knew you'd want to be in on it. Yeah, I was out at the ranch. Glad you got back in time. Where are you going to meet him? Out at the Benson place, quarter to six. It's 5.30 now. I was just leaving. Uh, Mr. Clements. Yeah. I know this is a big feather in your cap, but, uh... Will you let me bring him in? Well, I, uh... I got my own reasons for asking. Yeah. Yeah, I guess it'll be all right. Thanks. Won't be coming up to work now, will you? No, I didn't say who'd meet him. Supposing he don't show. He'll be there. He's tired of running. Wants to give himself up. All right, come on, we better get going, Wendy. Sure, sure. Thanks again, Mr. Clements. See you at the sheriff's office at six. Right. All right, we got ten minutes. Let's go. There it is, up ahead. Yeah. I told you we had plenty of time. Uh-huh. Never saw a fellow so head up. Shh. Huh? Keep your gun handy. Oh, sure, sure, sure. Anybody here? What time you got? Uh, 20 to 6. I'm not here yet. Then. All right, come on. Let's have a look around. You take the back room. I'll take the front. Closets and everything. <laughs> I don't like it. I don't like it. Oh, 
Find anything? Wendy. Ah, nothing been here but pack rats. Oh. What time is it? Uh, 17-2. Oh, we got to wait, that's all. <laughs> Not even a box to sit on. Why, when I was... Try the floor. Huh? The oh, floor. Oh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Uh. <coughs> What's the time? Uh, 16-2. And if you're going to sit He's there... He's got to come. He will if you stop watching the clock. Mr. Clemens said quarter two, didn't he? Yeah. Uh, it's time. Shh. I don't hear not. Maybe his watch is wrong. Either. Yeah. Where are you going? I can look up the road. What time you got? Uh, 12-2. He's not coming. There's lots of things going If he was going to be here in the next five minutes, we'd see his horse by now. He's not going to show. Maybe his Come horse on. claimed himself. Come on. Where are we going? First, I'm going to make a phone call. Then we're going to the sheriff's office. <laughs> Folks, sure read the paper. Yeah. Not a living soul on the street. No. Uh, who'd, uh, who'd you call, Caleb? I can't tell you yet. But, uh, Later, where are maybe. Wendy. Huh? When we get in here, no matter what happens, I want you to keep that lip buttoned. Sure, kid. Sure, sure, sure. Well, let's go. Remember, Wendy. Yeah, sure, sure. What time is it? Uh, six o'clock. There's your man, Sheriff. What? Wendy. I'll take those guns back, sir. Sure, Sheriff. Yours too, Wendy. Go ahead, Wendy. Oh, what? I told you he'd be here at six. Yes, Mr. Clemens. You ready to sign a confession, Baxter? Yes, sure. But this is... Shut up, Wendy. Just one thing I want to know. How did you know it was me? Easy. Right after you took a couple of shots at Mr. Clemens last night, he called me and told me he was sure the Allen killer was in town. Went out to the Benson place this morning and took one of your slugs out of the wall. I got the ballistics report from the county seat this afternoon. It matched the slug we found in Jed Allen. I see. Uh, do you mind if I smoke, Sheriff? No, go ahead. Uh, well, I haven't got one on me. Uh, you got a cigarette, Clemens? No, I smoke cigars. Have one of mine if you like. They're pretty strong, though. Picky Yoon's. <clears throat> well, then you were out at the ranch this afternoon. Yeah, I told Maria to be careful. He might be back. How'd you know I was out there? Mr. Clemens told me. Well, you ready to sign? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you want a good laugh? I've been running all over the county chasing a killer. And you know who I've been chasing? Me. What do you mean? Never mind right now. Just one thing more. You said Clemens was sure I was the Allen killer. Is that exactly what he said? What difference Yes, he said he was sure. Well, didn't that strike you funny, Sheriff? Well, why should it? Why would Mr. Clements be sure I was the killer when he'd never seen me before in his life? I'll tell you why. Because... Excuse me. Sheriff Steele. Yes, he's here. Just a minute. For you, Baxter. Oh, thanks. Hello? This is Miss Howard again, Mr. Baxter. Yeah? I have the information now, but it's confidential and we can't release it. It's mighty important. I'm sorry. Well, maybe if I let you talk to the sheriff. Well... Uh, sheriff, this is Miss Howard of the State Highway Department at Phoenix. We're wasting... Just a minute, Mr. Clemens. Hello, Miss Howard. Ask her if she'll give you the information. Can you release this information to me? Yes. I see. Mm Mm-hmm. I see. Well, thank you very much, Miss Howard. Yes. Yes, you betcha. Thank you. Goodbye. Uh, Let's get this over with. What were you saying when the phone rang back, sir? Well, I said Mr. Clemens was sure I was the killer because he was the only one in town who knew... I wasn't Caleb Baxter. What'd you say? That's right. And he was sure I wasn't Caleb Baxter because he's the only one who knew the real Caleb Baxter. Oh, that's crazy. And he knew the real Baxter because Clemens hired him to do the shooting. When he saw the initial CB on my holsters, he knew I was carrying the guns that had killed Jed Allen. Why would Mr. Clemens want to kill Jed Allen? Because I Mr. don't care what that woman said on the phone. It isn't against the law to own a construction company in another town. It's a free country. Anyone can make a bid on... Mr. Clemens, the woman on the phone didn't tell me anything. She said the information was confidential and couldn't be released. 
the whole thing's crazy. Clements Why, I... here had Jed Allen shot down because he was against the new highway, and Clements was bidden for the construction contract. He said he was guilty. Why don't you lock Just him up? Just a minute, up? Clements. Have you any way to prove you're not back, sir? Well, sure, I... Sure, I can do it. You betcha. I knew all along who he was. Maybe I forget faces, but I never forget a head of hair. Why, I cut his hair when he was just a little shaver. He's Jed Allen's boy, Billy. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, it's crazy, I tell you. You can't prove a thing. I, uh, I talked to the real Baxter on the phone this morning. That's impossible. He's dead. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Clements. Finish what you're going to say. Don't anybody move. Put that gun up, Clements. Sure, when I get about 20 miles between us. Yeah, I know Baxter's dead because I loaded his canteens with sand. Oh, you dirty... Look out, kid. Get, get back. I'll kill you. You no, no, no use, kid. I'll break your... Get n- back, I said get back. Uh, well... That's better. I want to kill you for that. Where's Winnie? He ducked out. <laughs> Too hot for him. <laughs> now, where were we? Oh, sure. I had Jed Allen killed because he was always getting in my hair. But if it hadn't been for him, I'd have made a fortune on that highway. He got just what was coming to him. Now I'm clearing out of here, and when I go out that door, I don't want either of you to make a move for one minute. So long, Sheriff. That's... <laughs> Allen... Come on, Bill. There he goes. Come on, get ho- He let the horses go. Wendy, what's the matter with you? He won't. Are you crazy? He won't get far. Come on, cut it out. Here, look at this. Give me that thing. It is. What is it? It's an empty, it an empty bottle. Hair tonic. You mean you put it in his... Yeah. In his canteen. <laughs> Title, Dead Ringer. The story of a man whose search for a killer led him to himself. And friends, if you like Bill's story, why not come back next week? I'll have a man whose very life depended on a single blade of grass, not ten feet from civilization. I like to call it Juniper Bush. So until next week, this is John Steele saying, A life of adventure is yours for the asking, wherever you find it. Only, don't look for it. It may find you. Well... Goodbye and good hunting. John Steele Adventurer is produced by Robert Monroe, written and directed by Elliot Drake. John Larkin was heard as Bill. Also in our cast were Brian Rayburn, Earl George, and Howard Kane. John Steele is played by Don Douglas. Musical effects were created by Doc Whipple. Your announcer is Ted Malley. Remember, next week, Mutual presents Juniper Bush, another story of suspense and action from the files of John Steele, adventurer. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Hollywood, it's dream time. Turn it up a little, will you, Don? Sure, Danny. Ladies and gentlemen, the makers of Dream Shampoo are pleased to present the ninth in a series of new programs written by Phil Rapp, produced by Carlton Alsop, and starring Don Amici, Danny Thomas, and Francis Lang, producing... Oh, it's a good day for singing a song, and it's a good day for moving along. Yes, it's a good day. How could
could anything go wrong? A good day from morning till night. Yes, it's a good day for shining your shoes, and it's a good day for losing the blues. Everything's a gain and nothing to lose, but it's a good day from morning till night. I said to the sun, good morning, sun. Rise and shine today. You know you gotta get going if you're gonna make a showing, and you know you got the right of way. Cause it's a good day for paying your bills, and it's a good day for curing your ills. So take a deep breath and throw away your pills, cause it's a good day from morning to night. A good day from morning to night. For the last eight weeks, ladies and gentlemen, Don Amici has tried unsuccessfully to help Danny Thomas overcome his morbid fear of the microphone. Danny's condition has become steadily worse, and he remains steadfastly concealed in a broom closet. This evening, a rumor sped through the corridors of NBC that he was becoming violent. Turn it Naturally, down a little, Don Amici, Don? who considers sure, Danny his Danny. personal charge. First time I ever saw a radio in a broom closet. Not a radio, it's a ventilator. A ventilator? Sure, I can hear all the programs. I listen in while you're rehearsing, too. You mean you can hear everything we say? Mm-hmm. Everything? Every single word. I heard you this afternoon, Doc. Well, uh, 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 now you understand, Danny, that people sometimes say things that... Yeah, sure, but they don't have to say them so loud and so often. <laughs> well, honest, Danny, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean to Feels say anything... funny, don't it? Kind of like getting your nose caught in a ringer, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, and I wish you'd stop twisting the handle. Well, look, I'll let you take your nose out of the bucket if you say you're sorry. I'm sorry. I said it 50 times. You don't sound sincere enough. I don't know. Well, how sincere can a man sound? Listen, I'll show you some real sincerity. Wait till I tune in the ventilator. Not 50%. Listen to that. Not 75%, uh-huh. but 100% luster for your hair How when you that? shampoo with Dream. Now, that's real sincerity. Tell them, Toby. Yes, never before Dream could any shampoo bring out all the sparkle, all the brilliance, all the luster of your hair. You see, all soap shampoos leave a coating of film on hair that covers up and dulls its natural luster. But Dream is not a soap shampoo. Never leaves dingy film. Instead, Dream Shampoo with hair conditioning action leaves hair radiantly bright and clean, truly 100% lustrous. And what's more, Dream does not dry out your hair. Its fragrant, freshening whipped cream leather leaves it sublimely smooth, easier to set, easier to curl, easier to arrange. And Dream removes unsightly dandruff flakes the first time you use it. So for lovely, lustrous hair that gleams in all its glory... Dream Shampoo with Hair Conditioning Action. Use it at home or ask for it at your beauty shop. Buy it at all drug department or ten cent stores. Remember, never before dream could any shampoo leave your hair so lustrous, yet so easy to manage. Dream, the shampoo that reveals not 50%, not 75%, but 100% luster for your hair. D-R-E-N-E. That's what I call sincerity. Now, say you're sorry for all the nasty things you said about me and make it sound like Toby. Not 50%, not 75%. I'm 100% sorry. S-O-R-R-Y. Okay. (laughs) Now you can beat it. Well, I will as soon as you give me back my pants. There they are on the end of the mop. And now here is your host for the evening. Wait a minute till I put on my pants. Certainly. How do you like that? A two-way ventilator. He's got him on now, Toby. Go ahead. And now, here is your host for the evening, Don Amici. Thank you, thank you ladies and gentlemen, and good evening. What happened to you, Don? You look like you've been through the ringer. I have, Francis. I just spent a terrible half hour in the broom closet with that maniac. What maniac? Thomas. Went down there to find out what was wrong with him, and he locked me in and stole my pants. He did? I wondered why you were wearing those seat covers. Seat covers? 
Well, it, it was dark in there. Bring them back, Amici. Your pants don't fit the Davenport. <laughs> Who's that? It's Danny Thomas. He's talking through the ventilator, and he can hear every word we say. This program gets more fantastic every week, but this week it sounds like the week after next. If you want me, I'll be in my dressing room crocheting a straight jacket. Francis. If you go past the broom closet, honey, drop in for a bucket of sun. Shut up, Thomas. <laughs> hey, Don, what do you want? What kind of talk is that? Oh, I'm sorry, Carmen. I'm losing my mind here. What is it? Well, I brought a guest tonight. Mr. Gordon. He's an interior decorator. Gordon? That name sounds familiar. It should. He's been on this program seven times now. <laughs> Carmen, uh, what do we want with an interior decorator? Well, he's going to do the house I rented, and uh, we, if we advertise him a little, he might knock off a few bucks. Why don't you tell him the real reason, Carmen? What's the real reason? I do a song about it later. Somebody shut that ventilator. Get shut. Thanks. That'll keep him quiet. Now, about this interior decorator, Carmen. Excuse me, sir. Mr. Dragon, I hate to be brusque, but I'm a very busy man. Lots of places to decorate. And there's a Quonset hut on West Carmen, Adam. why don't you tell Mr. Gordon what you want and let him run along? Well, I don't know if he can find the house, Don. We haven't put the number up yet. I'll attend to it. Pink neon numerals with a blue halo. Ramp the dream. <laughs> well, uh, the house is in the middle of the block on Goober Street. You'll recognize it. Because it has a very wide back porch. A wide back porch. Well, it's not exactly a back porch uh, because it's really on the side of the house. But our front door is at the side, so that kind of moves it around. <laughs> Then it's the front porch. No, there is a front porch. But that's way around in the back. The front door is on the side, the back porch is in front, and the front porch is in the back? Uh, depends on which way you're facing, really. <laughs> Carmen, are there windows in the roof? There were three, but we had them plastered over. Anyway, I don't think you can miss the place, Mr. Gordon. It's got a pretty vine with big yellow flowers. A vine, huh? Does it belong to the Arbutus family? No, I think the family who moved out was named Kelly. <laughs> Uh, they left it there. Good-looking vine. Sure. Creeping Kelly. <laughs> I'll find it. Just tell me what period the house is furnished in now, Mr. Dragon. Well, it's kind of mixed up. In the living room, we have Louis the Fourteenth. The bedrooms are Louis the Twelfth, And in the attic, you'll find Louis Delancey. Louis Delancey? My brother-in-law. He lives up there with a goat. <laughs> Rather stuffy in here, isn't it? Might we have some air? Sure. I'll open the ventilator. How's that? That's fine, Carmen. Thanks. There's that Thomas again. I beg your pardon? Nothing, Mr. Gordon. Uh, why don't you go out and decorate Carmen's house? Yes. Mr. Dragon, if you don't object, I should like to do the entire house in 18th century French. I know where you can lay your hands on a stunning bed. Yeah, but he wants a place to put his body. I beg your pardon? I didn't say anything. Yes. <coughs> This is a seven-foot Louis the Sixteenth bed. Well, if you don't object, we prefer a twin bed. Why should he object? It's a pity, though. Such a beautiful bed. Louis the Sixteenth. Cut it in half and make two Louis the Eighth. <laughs> I beg your pardon? I didn't say anything. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Dragon... How would you feel about Duncan Pipe in your house? Oh, we can't take any more boarders unless my brother... Carmen. <laughs> Duncan Pipe is a style of furniture. Oh, no kidding. I thought it was a musical instrument. I beg your pardon? I didn't say anything. Let me close that ventilator. Hey, hey, wait, Don. Don't close. <laughs> How do you like that? Shuts the ventilator right in my face. Big interior decorator. What's so tough about being an interior decorator? All you need is a sense of color, taste, arrangement, design, and contrast. That's five senses. And what's five senses? Nickel. <laughs> I got a quarter. I could be five interior decorators. That's a big thing. I bet I could decorate this broom closet to look just like the Taj Mahal. I could even decorate the Taj Mahal to look like a broom closet. <laughs> Well, I'll move the mops over here, drape the vacuum cleaner with Amici's pants. Now, this Clorox bottle would make a nice lamp, sort of give the whole thing a touch of color. And I could use the bucket for a lampshade. Oh, that's a little pale. <laughs> you got it, huh? The bucket's a little pale. Oh, wow, I'm murdered tonight. Oh, but I'm really an interior decorator, though. Oh, rugs, drapes, chairs, sofas, beds, they're all under my skin. Makes it tough to get my clothes on, but... 
Such a few lumps to a great man like me. Chippendale Heppelwhite Thomas, the greatest interior decorator in the world. Gee, I can see me now in my famous establishment. And that tremendous sign outside. We fix flat. <laughs> I'll show the world new designs for living. Why not? It's a free country. I'm a decorator. I mean, citizen. Now, some people make a table from a worn-out cobbler's bench. Some people make an icebox from an old grandfather's watch. Some interior decorators like 18th century French. Oh, but I always decorate my interior with 20th century scotch. <laughs> Excuse me, I, I over-decorated. <laughs> you see, I keep searching, ever seeking something new. So put your house in my hand, and here's what I'll do for you. I'll paint the walls red and purple, the ceiling blue and green, with rainbows interspersed to break the gloom. I'll do the floors in gray and yellow, but the woodwork plain serene, so there won't be too much color in the room. Now, with every step you'll luxuriate, you'll sink into the rug. Instead of wool, I'll make it solid sheep. I'll put the mattress in the top and the pillow in the sink. So you can bathe and wash your hair while you're asleep. <laughs> and your ceilings will be four feet high. If you kneel, you'll have plenty of headroom. Why, if not for my modern, ingenious ideas, you know you'd have to sleep in the bedroom. <laughs> I'll put the chair on the table, the table on the couch. That'll give you all the space you need. I'll make the stove look like the lamp the lamp look like the stove, but you'll have to get into the oven to read Forever Hamburger. Oh, oh wait a minute. Give me a chance. Give me a chance here. Let me tell you about my most exciting contribution to interior decorating. It was the beginning of Brooklyn Renaissance, and is familiarly known as Sacrificing Animated Mobile Formaldehyde Love Seats. You may well ask. What is the sacrificing animated mobile formaldehyde love seat? Look, I'll explain it to you step by step. Now, sacrificing is a divided word. Sac being a container. Riff is a native of Morocco, and icing is a sweet stuff on the top of cake. Animated is next. Anna is something left over from the king of Siam. <laughs> and made it is getting married. Mobile is obvious. Mo runs a hamburger joint in Toledo. And Bill is my brother who owns a saloon. Formaldehyde starts with form, which means the shape of a person. Al is a guy in a second-hand business. D is the way they say law in Brooklyn. And Hyde is to conceal something. So, in short, my invention, the sacrificing animated mobile formaldehyde love sheet, is a native of Morocco who goes into Moe's hamburger joint where he meets Anna, who's shaped like a person with sweet stuff on top left over by the king of Siam. <laughs> so he marries her in Toledo. And as they say in Brooklyn, in honor of the celebration of this connubial blister, they visit my brother Bill's saloon and wind up happily ever after an L second hand joint loaded under a love seat. <laughs> so if you need decoration, just leave it all to me, and you will have a house that's talked about. Now I visualize the place completed. I can see myself there now. Richard, open the door, let me out. <laughs> this place is awful. So, Jack, take me back to the shack and hack and sack on the other side of the track. A thousand miles from Toledo, Ohio. Special music by Carmen Dragon. Never before dream, yes, never before dream, could any shampoo reveal 100% of the natural luster of your hair. Never before dream could any shampoo leave your hair so lustrous, yet so easy to manage. When you dream your hair, you bring out all its sparkling natural highlights. When you dream your hair, you glamorize all its soft, 
thrilling texture. When you dream your hair, you remove all luster-dulling film and unsightly dandruff flakes. And Dreen's rich whipped cream lather leaves your hair easier to set, easier to curl, easier to arrange. Yes, never before Dream could any shampoo reveal 100% of your hair's natural luster. And never before Dream could any shampoo leave your hair so lustrous, yet so easy to manage. D-R-E-N-E, Dream Shampoo. <laughs> the music of Carmen Dragon and his orchestra, lovely Francis Langford sings Temptation. and Francis Langford as John and Blanche Bickerson with Danny Thomas as Brother Amos in The Honeymoon is Over. The Bickersons have retired. Mrs. Bickerson dozes in fits and starts as husband John, cursed with the rarest type of insomnia in the annals of medical history, fights another losing battle during an acute stage of his chronic malady. Listen. Mm -hmm. like a girl at her first party. What are you dreaming about? Party girl. What? What? What did what, you say, Blanche? I'm just not going to stand for it. One of us is going to have to sleep in the kitchen. Take the blanket with you. <laughs> I'm not moving. If you're going to snore your head off and giggle all night, get out of the bedroom. Blanche, why don't you leave me alone? I'll bet I haven't had ten minutes sleep all night. And then I had a terrible dream. If I ever dream again that you kiss Gloria Goosby, I'll never speak to you again as long as I live. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Oh. What? In front of a whole room full of people, too. Blanche, have you gone crazy? Don't try to get out of it. Everybody saw you. Nobody saw me. You dreamed it. That's a pretty poor excuse, John Dickinson. <laughs> I don't have to make 
any excuse. I didn't do anything. Can I help it if, if, if you dream I kissed Gloria Gooseby? Can she help it? I noticed she didn't try to stop you. She never tries to stop me. I, I mean, I wouldn't kiss Gloria Gooseby if she were the last woman on earth. I hate Gloria Gooseby. Now, are you satisfied? Maybe I am, but you're going to have to explain to her husband, Leo. Explain what? There would have been an awful fight. Lucky for you, I woke up just as he came in. <laughs> Psychiatrist, Blanche. That's right. Try and make me believe I'm crazy. Have me put away in an institution. Lock me in a padded cell. Nobody's gonna lock you in a padded cell. Let me spend the rest of my life in a restraining sheet. Nobody to talk to, always alone. Blanche! Why don't you come and visit me, John? <laughs> You're putting on this act to ruin my night's sleep. You've succeeded. My brother Amos warned me about marrying you. Amos. Believe me, I'm finding out plenty now. The things you said when I first met you. Such promises. Before you married me, you told me you were well off. I was, but I didn't know it. <laughs> good night, Blanche. We barely have enough to eat. Everybody makes a good salary except you. Why don't you get a paying job? Oh, now, don't go maligning my job. It pays fine. The minute I ask you for an extra few dollars, you jump down my throat. Well, listen, last month you went to the doctor three times. You got fitted for new glasses. You had two teeth pulled. Seventy dollars for your own private pleasure. <laughs> you think I'm made of money? You're the one who wastes it. You throw it away on silly things. I deny myself everything. I save every nickel I can. How do I throw money away? Didn't you pay twenty-two dollars for that fire extinguisher? Well, certainly. We've had it a whole year and never used it once. <laughs> I'll set fire to the house in the morning. Why don't you return it and get your money back? Okay, I'll take it back tomorrow. You say it, but you won't do it. Take it back to the store now. What? Go on, get up and take the fire extinguisher back. Grant, you must be out of your mind. It's half past two in the morning. Wake the man up. He has no business selling it to you in the first place. Grant, <laughs> as sure as you're born, if I take that fire extinguisher back, the house will burn down. I wish it would. I hate this pest hole. My pantry is overrun with ants. Ants in your pantry. <laughs> you talk about wasting money. We could have had that lovely bungalow in Westwood if you hadn't insisted on buying an automobile. Oh, a man's got to have an automobile. But that bungalow is only a stone's throw from the bus line. Got no time to throw stones at buses. <laughs> Blanche, all I want to do is sleep. Sure, sleep your life away. That's the trouble with you. You have no initiative. Look at Mel Shaw. He came to California six years ago without a dime in his pocket. Mm. He borrowed a basket from a hardware store and peddled little statues from door to door. What do you suppose he's worth today? Nothing, and he still owes for the basket. <laughs> it's almost three o'clock. Amos has the right idea. He's in politics now. He's running for assemblyman in the fifth ward. He couldn't run for dog catcher. I'll bet he'll be elected. You'll see. He's a good politician. What do you know about politics? You've never even voted in your life. I did yesterday. Eight times. <laughs> Eight times? Amos showed me how. It's so simple. All you have to do is use a different name each time. We copied them off Tombstone. A political ghoul. Now, you stay out of that racket. Do you hear me, Blanche? I think it's a wonderful business. You ought to go into politics, John. There's a fortune in it. I read only yesterday where some senator was put in jail for grafting $100,000. Why don't you do it? Go to jail for grafting? No, be a senator or something. Maybe you and Amos could be the next governors of Georgia. <laughs> now I know what they mean by strange bedfellows. Why don't you let me sleep, Blanche? You know we're going to have to be up late tomorrow night. What for? What for? Have you forgotten it's my boss's silver wedding anniversary? Heavens, is tomorrow Monday? Yes, tomorrow's Monday. I'll have to put you out of your blue suit press. It's a formal dinner. I'm wearing my new tuxedo. It won't be here until Tuesday. It's here now. No, it isn't. It is, too. I looked in the closet yesterday. Did you look today? I don't have to. Tuxedos can't walk away. I'll let Amos borrow it. That's fine. You what? I lent your tuxedo to Amos. He's making a campaign speech tomorrow night at the garbage men's ball. <laughs> you didn't. You didn't dare give that no good tramp my new tuxedo. Don't you call my brother a tramp. Now, You've look, got Blanche. a lot of nerve, John Biggison, to take such an attitude towards a man who's putting himself out in order to make life easier for his constituents. Blanche. It's a formal affair, and you can't expect him to attend in a business suit. But it's all right for me to go to a formal affair in my overalls, huh? Now, don't get hysterical. Uh, oh, why do you do this to me? I saved for six months to get that tuxedo. I gave up. I gave up my lunches. I, oh, oh, my money. My hundred dollar bill. What's the matter with you? Oh, this is the end. I had a hundred dollar bill in the breast pocket. Where'd you get it? Every 
everybody at the office chipped in to buy the boss a present. I was holding the money. Blanche, if Amos finds it, I'll never get it back. Maybe he won't find it. Go to sleep. Go to sleep. <laughs> I'll be trying to believe. He'll never believe me. I can't call him up. He'll suspect something fishy. He probably found the money. Maybe he didn't. I'll wait up all night. I can't sleep now anyway. Hmm. Never sleep another wink is long. Phone's dead. It's leaking. Put down that bottle of bourbon, silly. Oh. Maybe it's famous. Maybe, maybe, maybe he found the... Oh, no. Oh, put the lights on. The lights are on. You're in the closet. Oh. Hello? Jacko, this is Amos. I think he found it. Hello, Amos. Uh, are you dressed? Why would I be dressed at 3 o'clock in the morning? Well, I, I, I think maybe you were making a campaign speech. How's my tuxedo? Does it fit? Sure, it fits fine. I had the pants shortened a little. <laughs> uh-huh. I don't think he found it. Oh, it's a swell tuxedo, Jocko. A nice, roomy pocket. He found it. <laughs> In the pan. He didn't find it. Uh, did, you, did you try on the coat, Amos? No, I left it at the tailor's. I'm having it let out a little. What, what's the tailor's name? Quick. What do you want to know for? Well, it, uh, 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 it, it, it's the wrong coat. They, uh, they, 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 gave, they gave me the wrong coat. I, I'll take it back and, uh, and send you the right one. Oh, it's the right coat, all right, Jacko. It is, huh? You found it. <laughs> what are you mumbling about? Nothing. How's the pockets in the coat? Are they roomy? <laughs> they hold enough, I guess. Oh, the reason I call is to tell you I won't be needing a tuxedo after all. Oh, you won't, huh? No, I'm giving up politics. I found an easier way to pick up some dough. That settles it. He's got my hundred bucks. What? I was talking to Blanche. I'll pick up the suit in the morning. Okay, Jacko. Good night. Drop dead. <laughs> now what do I do? I don't know whether Chislet found the money or not. I won't be able to sleep. Oh, go to sleep, John. He didn't find the money. Oh, how do you know, Blanche? Because I went through the pockets before I gave him the tuxedo. Honest? Honest did you, Blanche? Of course I did. Oh, thank heaven. You've got the hundred dollars. No, I haven't. I bought a new evening gown with it. Oh! Good night, John. Oh, Toby Reed reminding you for lovely, lustrous hair, use Dream. No other shampoo, only Dream shampoo with hair conditioning action leaves your hair more lustrous, yet so easy to manage. Listen next Sunday for another pleasant half hour with Don Amici, Danny Thomas, Francis Langford, Carmen Dragon and his orchestra. And now here is Don Amici wishing you good days, good nights, and good luck until we meet again. Everybody's talking about Dreft, the greatest dishwashing discovery in 2,000 years. Dreft, D-R-E-F-T, Dreft, Procter & Gamble's sudsing miracle that gets dishes so clean they shine even without wiping. Yes, it makes even glasses sparkle like jewels. Dreft simply can't leave any streaks on dishes the way all soaps do. Why, with Dreft, your nicest glassware positively shines. Dreft is kind to your hands, too. Get Dreft in the bright green package. That's D-R-E-F-T, Dreft. Danny Thomas appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of the new murder mystery, Lady in the Lake. Ladies, it's more important than ever that you save kitchen fat every day, every mealtime. To help get more soap, fabrics, and other items you want and need... Save those fats. The need is urgent. The reason, sound. And dealers now pay more per pound. (laughs) 
This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.